Right, well, welcome everybody to the last of our spring uh, series of opening the Angus online seminars for the Friends of the Angus. We're absolutely delighted that you've joined us this evening and we're looking forward to a very interesting evening together. My name is Emily Burgoyne and for those of you who don't know me, I am the Angus Librarian at Regent's Park College in Oxford. I'm going to say a few very quick words about the Friends of the Angus in a moment, but before I do, um, here's a little bit of housekeeping, a few practicalities um, about how the evening is going to run. So firstly, I'd like to let you know that the seminar is being recorded and that's with a view to it being made available um, for other people who cannot attend this evening. So if you don't want your presence here to be recorded, you can either turn off your camera so that your face isn't um, visible in the gallery, or now that you've been admitted into the meeting, you can change the name on your screen. And you'll notice that we have muted everybody here this evening. That's just to avoid background noise interference. Please can you stay on mute unless you're invited to speak during the question and answer session and then I will ask you to unmute yourself. And you can use the chat function uh, to let me know that you'd like to ask a question and you can give me a rough idea of what the question is about. You can just then um, put that in the, the chat function and then I will invite you to unmute at an appropriate moment to ask your question. So after Dr. Alder's talk, we will have a five minute break where we go away from the screen and you can stretch your legs, get a cup of tea, and think of an interesting question uh, to ask Dr. Alders about her talk. So just a few very quick words about the Angus. Um, we started the Friends of the Angus a few years ago uh, with the um, express aim of trying to highlight the importance, the uniqueness and the richness of the collections that we have in the Angus Library, to also highlight the incredible research that goes on in the Angus and also to uh, raise money for digitization and conservation of some of the most uh, fragile and important material that we have. And so far, thanks to the incredible generosity of the Friends of the Angus, we've raised enough money to digitize our anti-slavery commonplace book, which is an incredible document, a unique, uh, we are the only place to have this. Uh, and we've also digitized the Broughton Church books We've digitized um, the Cripplegate Church book from the 17th century, and we've managed to digitize all of Jane Atwater Blatch's uh, diaries, which I'm sure Dr. Alders will be mentioning this evening in her talk. And we're also just about to start conservation work on a wonderful volume of anti-slavery tracts uh, that were published and sold by a Baptist female um, bookseller, Martha Gurney. And this is all due to the incredible help and generosity of the Friends of the Angus. So um, I, there's absolutely no obligation to contribute to uh, what we're doing. I understand that for a lot of people, it, it's not possible to uh, donate at the moment. But if you can, it would be hugely great, uh, hugely appreciated by me and by my colleagues in the Angus. Uh, we would be protecting and preserving our collection for the scholars and the researchers of today and in the future. So I'll, I'll put a little link in the, the chat function. And if you if you are able to donate, uh, you'll be able to follow that link and donate on there. So now, without further ado, it gives me great pleasure to introduce to you this evening uh, our speaker, Dr. Cindy Alders. Dr. Cindy Alders is director of the John Richard Allison Library and the Associate Professor of the History of Christianity at Regent College, a theological graduate school affiliated with the University of British Columbia in Vancouver, Canada. A graduate of the University of Oxford's doctoral programme in history, she's the author of The Spiritual Lives and Manuscript Cultures of 18th Century English Women, published by Oxford University Press in 2024. And to express the ineffable, The Hymns and Spirituality of Anne Steele, published in 2008. And she's also written numerous book chapters and articles. She's taught and spoken widely to international audiences on the history of women's theological and literary contributions to diverse cultures. 
Her current research explores the religious lives of 18th century children. So welcome to you, Dr. Cindy Alders, with this evening's Friends of the Angus talk, Live Writing as Spiritual Legacy, Lessons from the Steel Collection. Thank you so much, Emily. <clears throat> I'm really pleased to be able to speak with you today as part of the Friends of the Angus Seminar Series. My relationship with the Angus began about 15 years ago when I was a graduate student at Regent College in Vancouver. I had set out to write a thesis on the 18th century British hymn writer Anne Steele. And as part of my research, I came to Oxford, where I spent two very happy weeks reading Steele's manuscripts in the Angus and falling in love with archival research. Some years later, I moved to Oxford as a doctoral student and expanded my reading at the Angus to include the manuscripts of other women in the Steele circle. And that research is included in my just published book, uh, seen here, um, The Spiritual Lives and Manuscript Cultures of 18th Century English Women. And my paper today is drawn from chapter four, which is titled Life Writing as Spiritual Legacy. So in the book, I look at three networks of women of different denominational affiliations, and I explore how they use life writings, including letters, diaries, and poetry written for each other to participate in religious communities. In the book, I analyze how women's life writings were used in a variety of relationships. So in a chapter titled The Encouragement of Spiritual Friends, I use manuscripts to discern patterns of friendship. And I explored how letters, for example, were used intentionally to reflect on theological themes together. I'm just going to move through these chapters very quickly to get us to chapter four. Um, so in a chapter titled The Wisdom of Spiritual Elders, I explore the role of older women in various communities and how letters were used by them to direct younger women, sometimes with books also being sent through the post. Please don't feel that you need to read everything on there. Those are um, headings and subheadings uh, within the book in each chapter. In a chapter titled The Instruction of Spiritual Children, I look at the vital role played by aunts and single women in caring for children, including spiritually. Um, and I explore a number of literary interactions, including the use of diaries to teach religious seriousness. And then finally, I explore the afterlives of religious women's life writings. And my paper today focuses on this theme, though limits its discussion to manuscripts found in the fabulous Steele collection and associated papers at the Angus. For the uninitiated, the Steele collection is a vast multi-generational archive related to the long-standing Baptist family who once lived in and around the village of Broughton in Hampshire. And Steele was its most famous member but the archive demonstrates that many of the women were avid writers of diverse genres, including those genres now known to historians and literary scholars as life writings. So today I want to ask how manuscripts in the Steele Collection were preserved and how they functioned in religious communities after the death of their authors. Who are these authors? For today's purposes, this is the relevant part of the Steele family tree. Our main authors are Anne Steele, the hymn writer, seen um, in the circle just at the left, her stepmother, Anne Cater Steele, at the top, who is an avid diarist, and Jane Atwater on the right, another prolific diarist, who I'm thrilled to hear. Her diaries have been fully digitized now. But we'll also hear from and about Mary Steele Wakeford, who is Anne Steele's half-sister, their niece, Mary Steele, their cousins, Anna, um, Anna Atwater and Jane Gibbs, 
Anna Atwater's children, Caroline Atwater, and as I've already mentioned, Jane Atwater, and their children, Mary Whitaker and Anna Blatch. So there are a lot of names that are going to come up um, as I talk today. Don't feel that you need to like try to remember this family tree. Just go with it. Scholars of manuscript cultures have highlighted the ways in which a historiographical emphasis on print culture has obscured women's engagement in 18th century intellectual and literary worlds. But what does the consideration of manuscript cultures reveal regarding women's engagement in 18th century religious worlds? By tracing manuscripts across generations, we find that as women's writings continued to be read and cherished as spiritual legacy, they formed community memory and shaped religious identity. To give you a sense of where we're going, the topics I'll explore are the same as the three main headings on this slide that we've already seen. So women as keepers of manuscripts and meaning, life writing as memory and memorial, and more briefly, religious identity and culture. So first, women as keepers of manuscripts and meaning. The women whose life writings are preserved in the steel collection all wrote for posterity. Whether they wrote with an anonymous future reader in mind or a particular loved individual, they all wrote with the hope that their words would be read and would bear spiritual fruit. Their life writing served the immediate purpose of giving shape and meaning to their own spiritual lives, but they also were constructed with consideration for the future. Women were not simply passive participants in keeping and passing on religious meaning through, for example, the posthumous publication by others of their letters and diaries. They intentionally wrote and actively prepared their writing, writing, sorry, writings for a future readership. This anticipation of future readers is perceived clearly in the Steele family, whose religious writings were formally made part of their familial genealogy. The domestic archive into which Anne Steele's personal papers were integrated following her death in 1778 had been growing since the late 17th century. It contained the writings of her great grandfather and her mother who had died in 1680 and 1720. And she witnessed its expansion through the steady writing of her stepmother, Anne Cater Steele and her half sister, Mary Wakeford who had died in 1760 and 1772. It was natural for her to imagine her own poems and letters later joining the archive preserved in their home to be read by future members of the family. Her growing readership and reputation as a poet may have facilitated her ability to conceive of a future readership. Although other steels similarly assumed that their words would be read after their death. When urged by Anne Steele to participate in a serious religious correspondence, her half-sister, Mary Wakeford, argued that she was not a natural writer like her sister. Though having considered the future, she consented, writing, perhaps when I am no more, what I write, however mean, may, be may not be entirely despised. Alongside this imagined future audience, some personal papers were written and prepared for real audiences of loved individuals. Diaries in particular were often written as legacies for daughters. And Cater Steele specified that after her death, several volumes of her diary should be given to her daughter, Mary Wakeford. And she included instructions that would guide Mary Wakeford's use of them. Two slips of paper that are pinned together are tucked into the diary. You can see the pages here. The first is a note. Tis my desire that both this book and another in which is about nine or 10 years of my experience should be my own child's when she comes of understanding to keep them. 
The second, which you can see pinned below that, that top tiny note, um, is a short transcription from a sermon by the Puritan Richard Steele. And it reads, apply yourselves to the practice of real piety. By this, I mean that we should employ our chief care to procure and increase a lively faith, to exercise daily repentance, to strengthen our hope, to inflame our love of God and to our neighbor, to be diligent in watchfulness over our thoughts, words, and ways, in mortification of our sinful passions and affections, in the examination of our spiritual estate. Anne Cater Steele's diary had long focused her own efforts to practice real piety, um, but she intended the diary to have more than individual meaning. In passing on the transcription of Richard Steele's sermon, along with her diary, Anne Cater Steele illuminated her own diary writing practice and revealed her hopes for her daughter, furnishing her with both precept and practical example. In the next generation, Anne Cater Steele's niece, Jane Atwater, also prepared her diary for her daughter. In 1805, when her daughter Anna Blatch was 11 years old, Atwater reviewed the diary that she had been keeping for nearly 40 years and added a note on the back cover of one booklet. And it reads, my beloved Anna, I am not willing to destroy these papers for your sake. Should there be any sentence in the whole which may give you pleasure and profit in reading it, my end in saving them is answered. I commit them into your care and keeping. She hoped that Anna would one day find pleasure in reading her mother's words. But more than this, she hoped that her diary would help Anna to make greater advancement in the Christian life. In passing on her diary, she aimed to pass on her faith. And Marjorie Reeves describes Anna Atwater's, sorry, describes Jane Atwater's diary as intensely private. But in addressing her daughter in its pages and in her clear intention to pass the diary on to her, the diary was written not solely as an act of self-scrutiny or spiritual catharsis, but with a view to the future religious life of her family, generation by generation. Writing with a view to future audiences, Diarists strove to give voice to their thoughts and experiences, even as they withdrew into secrecy and encryption. Ciphers and censoring, present in writings expressly written for others, demonstrate the complexity of the genre and show how the individual and private purpose of religious diaries could coexist with pedagogical purposes. And perhaps it was this dual function, self-reflection, and spiritual exemplum that introduced Jane Otwater's practice of censoring her diary. She experimented with a cipher in 1779 and 1780, as you might be able to make out in the top picture, the part that is scratched out. She's using a shorthand there. And she, centered some, she censored some entries for 1782 by carefully exercising whole lines out of the text, which you can see here in the bottom picture. Other lines she heavily blacked out. So clearly the diary was not constructed wholly to promote her daughter's religious training. In writing for the future, the women represented in the Steele collection expected their papers to be preserved. But how did this happen? And what did their preservation mean in the Baptist context? Tracing the preservation of manuscripts across, across several centuries leaves inevitable lacunae. Yet sufficient data survive to point to the central roles of women in keeping and maintaining manuscripts, and with them, religious meaning. In her study of 18th and 19th century Quaker women, Sandra Stanley Holton observes that it was frequently women who preserved the letters and diaries of previous generations. 
She describes this as a typically feminine work of kin, which is consistent with women's greater likelihood to seek out family connections, exchange family news, ensure that family bonds were not broken, and to serve as family chroniclers. Ariane Baggerman also highlights family memory in her analysis of manuscript preservation. She sees the archive as, quote, a paper bulwark built and rebuilt by generations with a specific function, which was to preserve and protect a common family identity. With no children of her own, Anne Steele could not depend on descendants to preserve her manuscripts. Um, so in the Steele family, nieces played a crucial role in this process. Anne Steele's papers, um, and Anne Steele is seen in bold in the top left, are passed into the possession of her niece, Mary Steele, also in bold. So the, the people in bold were keepers of the manuscripts. Uh, Mary Steele also had no children of her own. So in time, she passed the papers on to her eldest niece, Mary Tompkins. With each generation, the archive grew. Mary Steele cared for her aunt's papers and manuscript poetry, but she also wrote poetry of her own, which in time was collected, copied, and maintained by her niece, Mary Tompkins. Mary Steele considered her niece to have inherited Anne Steele's character and poetic ability. And indeed, even her handwriter, handwriting resembled that of the, quote, revered Anne Steele. Mary Tompkins was, to her aunt, Mary Steele, one of our family, a writer as well. As Mary Steele played an important role in the preservation of her family's personal papers, her friend and cousin, Jane Atwater, uh, who is seen in the top right, likewise was instrumental in collecting and preserving her ancestors' papers, even as she added to them. Since Atwater's only child died young, the papers eventually were passed to her sister Caroline Whitaker's children, her sister also having predeceased her. As the ants used life writings in their active efforts to transmit faith to a younger generation, their nieces, who were the beneficiaries of those efforts, later performed important roles in preserving those writings for generations yet unknown. So again, in this family tree, um, keepers of the manuscripts are seen in bold right down to Marjorie Reeves into the 21st century. The preservation of Steele family manuscripts was highly localized, assisted by long association with particular houses. When her father died in 1785, Mary Steele inherited Broughton House, greatly Georgian Manor House, the large archive of family papers that had been accumulating for more than a century. Papers on the other side of the family, so this side of the family that you can see, seem early to have been associated with the Whitaker family home, Yew Trees, which is at Bratton in Wiltshire. In both cases, successive custodians of the archive lived in the same house, and many of those custodians were women. In her study of 18th century American women and memory, Susan Stabile argues that women's efforts to preserve memories were uniquely associated with the local and particular, including family homes. And she understands such efforts to be part of the process of building national memory in the early American Republic. By analogy, but with a different focus, the Steele and Atwater women's efforts to preserve life writings was an important means of building spiritual memory and meaning. Successive generations turned the pages written by their ancestors while adding words of their own. So the presence of each generation of these Baptist families is felt in the Steele collection. 
This is an active process of memory building. Mary Wakeford kept a diary that has not survived, but it was still extant in the late 19th or early 20th century when Selena Bompas, um, who died in 1921, transcribed selections from it. Bompas had a sense of her place within the Steele family story. With the help of the archive in her care, she wrote a history of her family for her niece or nephew, it's unclear, um, from the manuscripts. Her history is an example of domestic biography, which Christopher Tolley observes flourishing amongst religious families in the Victorian period. Addressing her reader warmly and personally, Bompas placed herself and them within the story she told, writing, for example. Among the first remembrances of both your mama and myself, um, she distilled the details of the papers in her care, all of those papers uh, written in one story for a niece or a nephew, um, to give a lively account of marriages and children, homes and businesses, and relayed family stories dating back to the 18th century. So at one point she wrote, the famous preacher Robert Hall wished to make our grandmother his wife, but he was eccentric in those young days and did not win her consent. She took care to portray her family's religious heritage and identity, writing, Mama followed her beloved mother's example and that of their ancestors, her ancestors, sorry, both Steele and Tompkins in worshiping in the Baptist church at Rotten. In the hands of subsequent generations, Baptist women's life writings were cherished. The memories of their authors kept affectionately alive, their religious experiences stimulating personal reflection in those who remembered. The women represented in the Steele collection each wrote for posterity. Believing their writing to have future meaning and usefulness, each participated in a process of preservation that was taken up after their deaths by those affectionately and spiritually nearer to them. In all cases, women performed key, though not exclusive, roles in the preservation of these papers, sorting, selecting, interpreting. And in acting as keepers of manuscripts, they preserved personal memory and religious meaning. Let's turn now to uh, this next topic, life writing as memory and memorial. Oft I frequent thy holy place and here almost in vain, a small a portion of thy grace my memory can retain. Jane Atwater was 16 years old in 1679, when she filled the small booklet she was using for her diary, opened a new booklet, and transcribed Isaac Watts's verse on its inside cover. This was a common poetic code she used to recollect one of her purposes in writing. Her diary was a spiritual aid memoir. She continued to remind herself of this purpose. In 1781, she wrote, my diary is a kind of repository which reminds me of past experience and in the various dispensations of providence. The women represented in the Steele collection described their impulse to write as a desire to know themselves and God more fully and to preserve records of their lives as reminders of God's care for them. Their writings were stores of personal memory material artifacts to which the writers could and did return for spiritual comfort in times of trouble. How was this sensibility transmitted across generations? And how did it help to constitute the collective memory of religious communities? Drawing a connection between memory and religion, Danielle Hervaux-Leger, argues that the authority of priests lies partly in their ability to mobilize and, quote, expound the true memory of the group. In their concern for the preservation of their writings, women could therefore be seen as performing quasi-priestly functions. 
Yet it is the uniqueness and personal quality of their author's histories and experiences, rather than any claim to representativeness or institutional authority, which infused these writings with meaning. Letters, diaries, and familial poetry brought to mind friends and family now dead. And in their textual representations of real life joys and struggles, later readers found inspiration and guidance for their own religious lives. Their authority was found as much in their familiarity as in their heroic religious example. Maurice Halwak uh, argues that autobiographical memory is richer and more consequential and meaningful than, quote, historic memory, by which he meant official or so-called objective histories. Women's writings represent an alternative to more official contemporary narratives. Personal narrative, the testimony of a witness, imbued women's life writings with power to shape religious identities and communities posthumously. Not only their words, the, but the material nature of women's life writings constituted religious memory and shaped spiritual communities. Manuscripts themselves might be said to constitute le de mémoire, which Pierre Nora considers sites for anchoring a group's memory, the quote, embodiment of memory in certain sites where a sense of historical continuity persists, places where memory crystallizes. Women's manuscripts can be seen as sites for anchoring the communal memory of religious communities. And alongside these manuscripts, religious memorabilia, including books and Bibles, are seen to have been active in memorial transmission. On several occasions, Jane Atwater recorded reading her late great aunt, uh, Anne Cater Steele's diary. And in it, she found a source of spiritual guidance and a sense of her place in her family's generational faith. In 1786, shortly after her mother died, Atwater turned to Anne Cater Steele's diary, expressing a particular interest in her mother's representation in the diary. And then she transcribed those sections into her own diary. The past week I've been reading in my honored Aunt Steele's diary, May it tend to quicken me in religious duties, wherein she was so diligent, speaking of my dear and honored parent, in May 1739. She says, Cousin Waters came. I had a good deal of sweet, agreeable talk with my niece, she designing God willing, to offer herself to the church the ensuing day in order to be baptized. Thus far, my aunt's recital of what concerned my dear mama at that time. Reading these old family papers provided a sense of connection with her past and of her place in her faith heritage, and it restored her lost mother of almost 50 years earlier, then about the same age as Atwater was as she read the diary. When Atwater read her great aunt's diary, Anne Cater Steele had been dead for 26 years. Her niece could not have done, known her well, since she was seven years old and lived 15 miles away when her aunt had died. <clears throat> Atwater's use of the diary confirms Cater Steele's honored place in family memory, as well as the authority imbued in her diary and its posthumous influence on the communal life of her over overlapping familial and religious community. As Cater Steele had guided the spiritual life of her family while living, the material artifact of her diary continued to shape the life of this extended Baptist family. When Jane Atwater picked up Anne Cater Steele's diary, she encountered a history of her family's religious life together. Merging spiritual diary and family chronicle, personal reflection was integrated with a collective record of her family's religious life as it occurred. When Cater Steele's niece, Jane Gibbs, was in Broughton in 1751, 
Her aunt was instrumental in guiding her to the decision to be baptized. Anne Cater still wrote in her diary that, that her niece was, quote, very subject to be surprised. And so Gibbs requested that she be permitted to write her spiritual experience rather than give it extempore in front of the Broughton Church. And her experience, um, this written experience, is preserved on a sheet tucked into Anne Cater Steele's diary. You can see it on the left there. Other written records are variously tucked, pinned, and stitched into the diary, including hymns by her stepdaughter, Anne Steele, with the dates on which they were sung in the local Baptist church, the tombstone, tombstone epitaph of a long dead relative, and poetry written by her stepson, William Steele. The inclusion and preservation of these documents denotes Anne Cater Steele's diary as a collage of her family's collective religious identity, an intimate and richly layered portrayal of communal life. Perhaps taking her cue from her great aunt, Jane Atwater's diary similarly represents a layering of religious experience and family connect connections. It contains poetry addressed to friends, letters to and from family members, and fragments of both her mother's and daughter's diaries, who both predeceased her. Atwater's mother kept a diary that survives only in fragments that are tucked inside her daughter's diary. And these insertions occurred at times of personal anxiety, Jane Atwater's personal anxiety. When Atwater's daughter, Anna Blatch, died at the age of 16, Atwater documented her declining health and eventual death in poignant detail. She kept a separate diary solely for the purpose of remembering those heartbreaking months and memorializing her daughter. So alongside her own journalistic account, she placed a page from her, the diary of her dead mother, Anna Atwater, which you can see that the, the sheet that's um, just placed on top on the left. She too, Anna Atwater, had lost a child over 50 years earlier and recorded the event in her diary writing, you can see this here, the death of my dear little babe was a sharper affliction than anyone can think. Either anticipating Blatch's death or an immediate response to it, Atwater slipped that page from her mother's diary into her own diary. Um, and so uh, yes, we can see that page from Anna Atwater's diary on the left with Jane Atwater's diary seen on the right, including additions that she later pinned into it. And you can see the pin in the bottom right corner. So she had revisited the diary, added, um, some additional text that she forgot or neglected to include the first time. In conversation then with her mother's earlier entry, we have Jane Atwaters. She writes, my beloved Anna departed this life about half after 12, O solemn day never to be remembered with, with the keenest anguish. Her mother had known what she now suffered and her earlier efforts to practice religious, or sorry, pious resignation now guided Atwater's response to her own loss. The urge to memorialize was strong amongst this Baptist family, owing in part to their memory of religious persecution. Throughout their archives are reflections in prose and poetry on the deaths of family members. These were deliberate attempts to remember much loved persons and in, by inscribing them in text and inserting them into their growing domestic archive. And Steele, for example, wrote a poem to Amira on the sudden death of her mother to comfort her half sister after the death of Ann Cater Steele. Mary Steele followed her aunt's example, writing um, similar poems in memory of family and friends. The family also composed often lengthy tombstone inscriptions, the texts of which are scattered throughout the archive. In 1811, after the death of Mary Steele's husband, 
she wrote a memorial and kept a drawing of his grave. Funeral sermons also were transcribed into books and lodged in the archive. The active effort to memorialize family members and a familial faith is evident in these written remains. The archive also contains various memorabilia, such as silhouettes of family members, which were powerful in evoking the presence of dead relatives and stimulating religious response. In 1773, when Mary Steele was 20 years old, she found a profile of her mother who had died uh, 11 years earlier. And she reflected on the moment in verse writing that, quote, memory steals the grateful filial tear and praying that the memory of her mother's pious example might, again, quote, guide my erring steps to heaven and thee. Alongside profiles are preserved hair samples, carefully labeled and tied with string, silhouettes, locks of hair, recipe books, school books, samplers. Baptist women's papers were part of a larger material cache that speaks of strong familial ties and were passed down generation to generation along with very physical reminders of ancestors' lives. Religious books and Bibles became sites of memory and religious meaning as they were imprinted with women's hopes of passing on faith within affectionate relationships. The Steel Archive reveals this gifting of books to be a chiefly female practice, uh, reflecting cultural trends of gendered giving, as well as women's felt responsibilities to guide the religious lives of children. Often this was the activity of mothers. In 1764, Jane Atwater's sister Caroline received from their mother a copy of Elizabeth Singer's, Singer Rowe's Letters Moral and Entertaining. The copy was published in 1733 and therefore may have belonged to Anna Atwater before she passed it on to her daughter. Nearly 25 years later in 1788, Caroline, now Whitaker, passed it on to her daughter. The inscription leaves a trail of mother's hopes for, that their daughters would accept the faith that had ordered their mother's lives as it memorializes the faith of mother and grandmother. So Caroline Atwater, her book, given to her by Anna Atwater, 1764. And then Mary Whitaker, the gift of her mother, 1788. Here the line runs out, for Mary Whitaker died in 1800, having no children of her own. But the book remained in the family as a memory of her lost life and the living faith of past generations. Aunts also were frequent donors of books, and this pattern also extended across generations. Anne Steele gave a New Testament to her niece, also called Anne, and this was likely on the occasion of her book, book sorry, birth, for it was published in 1769, which is the year the younger Anne Steele was born. The book is inscribed by Anne Steele. It says, O oh, may the sacred truths these leaves impart be blessed to reach my dearest Nancy's heart. May she love this book with attention and pray to God to teach her to understand and love it, that she may be wise unto salvation is the wish of her affectionate aunt, A. Steele. Anne Steele's Bible was printed in 1690 and therefore must have belonged to someone before her, for Steele was born almost 30 years later. 200 years later, it was still being passed through the family. An inscription dated 1893 reads, From Aunt Jane, S. Anne Bompas, Theodosia's Bible. Theodosia was the pseudonym under which Anne still published her hymns and poems. Now, Aunt Jane had been Anne Steele's great niece and was also the recipient of other religious books. A copy of Isaac Watts's hymns was inscribed first by her mother when she was nine years old, says Anne Steele Jr., 1778, and then by and then by eleven-year-old Jane, Jane Tompkins, give give her 
by her dear mama, June the 2nd, 1816. Jane Tompkins died in 1893 at the age of 88, when her niece, Selena Bompas, was 63. And Bompas continued the pattern of passing books and Bibles to nieces and daughters. In 1816, um, sorry, an 1816 volume containing Hester Chapone's Letters on the Improvement of the Mind and John Gregory's A Father's Legacy to His Daughters probably first belonged to Bompas's aunt. In 1920, it was inscribed by an unknown hand, given to me, M, at Cambridge by S.A.B., Selena Ann Bompas, old auntie. <laughs> These books were active in memorial transmission, com complementing women's life writings by evoking the memory and religious example of aunts and grandmothers, by helping future generations to locate themselves within a religious genealogy, and by encouraging contemporary belief. This gifting and passing on of books and Bibles sometimes transcended familial boundaries. Some books might have gained special meaning for a recipient based on the reputation or stature of the original owner, while others were passed on as a matter of affection. Such affectionate bequeathal was more typically feminine. Studies of wills show women's records revealing a more emotional investment in goods and effects. By unknown means, Anne Steele came into the possession of the Bible once owned by the theological writer Anne Dutton, who had died in 1765 um, in Great Granston, Huntingdonshire. Both were Baptist writers of some celebrity. So they may have known each other's work. And while there's no evidence that they actually knew each other, in 1735, decades earlier, Anne Cater Steele recorded a visit to Broughton from Dutton's husband, who was a Baptist preacher. Additionally, Anna Atwater owned a Bible previously owned by Elizabeth Rogers, which Jane Atwater came into the possession of after her mother's death. She then gave it to an unnamed recipient, evidently outside the family. A draft inscription is preserved in her diary. It reads, Elizabeth Rogers Bible, accept this as a gift of my dear and honored parent, Mrs. Anna Atwater. The women represented in the Steele Collection participated in a spiritual community in which women's life, life writings held religious meaning, functioning posthumously as sources of communal memory that were used to order contemporary religious life. These writings continue to have life and meaning long after the death of their authors. Then finally, and more briefly, in preserving manuscripts and managing archives that functioned as the corporate memory of a spiritual community, women were active in shaping religious identities and cultures. With their familial memory of religious persecution prior to the 1689 Act of Toleration, Baptists understood themselves religiously with reference to the past and therefore had a greater tendency to recount interwoven familial and spiritual genealogies than other religious communities. Women's writing activities were crucial in preserving these lineages of faith. Neil Keeble argues that nonconformists in the period were disproportionately literate on account of their greater need to reinforce their communal religious identity by telling stories of their past. Communication and writing, he states, were essential to, con to the continuance of nonconformity. John Seed elaborates, noting the importance of memory for nonconformists. He writes, the future of dissent required a continuing commitment to the past and the production of meaningful connections with dissenters of previous generations, stretching back beyond living memory. Dissent was, in other words, an identity rooted in narrative history. 
Seed focuses his analysis on official retellings of British nonconformity. He cites Edmund Calamy's published accounts of ejected ministers in 1702 and 1713, and Daniel Neal's History of the Puritans, or Protestant Nonconformists, published uh, between 1732 and 1738. Um, he cites these two books as especially important means by which the written word was effective in remembering, renewing, and reinforcing nonconformist identity. Both works focus on the lives of nonconformist ministers and were written by nonconformist ministers. While more hidden, women's unofficial and more personal retellings preserved in domestic archives were as effective in reinforcing Baptist identity, often on a more local level and within the context of close familial relationship. Facilitated by her reading of the personal papers of past generations, Jane Atwater had a strong sense of her position in a lineage of faith and family. In a letter to her sister, Caroline Whitaker, Atwater wrote of our ancient wor ancestors, sorry, our worthy ancestors and friends, a gay, a steel, an Atwater, a Whitaker, will not be forgotten, all died in faith. Her letter was an effort to write her family into biblical reflections on ancestral faith. She wrote a motto, she called it a motto, at the top of a draft of this letter, which is preserved in her diary. And it reads, wherefore, seeing we, are all, we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses. The, the verses from Hebrews 12, which commends the faith of the biblical patriarchs, from Abel through Abraham and Moses. Atwater recast this biblical lineage in more familiar terms, writing to her sister of their own ancient worthies. She considered herself to live in later periods of time, and she looked back to past generations who had borne a glorious testimony to the truth of her holy religion. Unlike those to whom Calamy and Neil pointed, Atwater clarified that these ancient worthies were also those with whom she and her sister were, quote, most intimately connected. And lest there be any doubt which Gay, Steele, Atwater, or Whitaker she admired, in a postscript, post postscript, she specified that they included matriarchs, our honored Aunt Steele, the amiable and pious Theodosia, our honored mother. That is, Anne Cater Steele, Anne Steele, and Anna Atwater, all of whom left personal papers that Atwater later read and reflected on in her own writing, were amongst those she considered most worthy. In Baptist circles, the life writings of Atwater, Steele, and other women were uniquely able to define a lineage of faith and shape religious identity and culture. Baptist ecclesiology avoided a centralized denominational confession, emphasizing instead that each local church was an independent gathered community. Without a leader like the Methodist John Wesley authorizing denominational positions or the formal synthesis of Anglican belief found in the Book of Common Prayer, Baptist churches located sources of authority more locally and personally. Women's life writings were one such source of authority, and the 18th century supplied the conditions for their favorable acceptance. This was a pivotal moment when a tendency to look back towards previous generations that were still within living memory converged with the fresh influence of the evangelical revival, and in so doing elevated memory, emotion, and personal experience and women's writings, which incorporated these qualities, as sites of spiritual authority. Life writers, writings stored in domestic archives, together with an emphasis on a lineage of faith, thus empowered Baptist women to shape religious identity and culture. So in conclusion, 
while a historiographical bias toward ecclesiastical structure and power for many years caused women to be excluded from the memory of the church. Considerable efforts have since been made to restore women to that memory. Rather than continuing this restoration work, however, in this paper, I have argued that 18th century women, as writers of letters, diaries, and other life writings, actively created spiritual memory and shaped religious cultures. Particularly active as preservers of manuscripts, they intentionally read and reread the papers in their care, finding in them direction for their own spiritual lives. The interwoven nature of spiritual and familial lineages is evident in Baptist women's writings, which often persist as richly layered accounts of a family's faith. In turning to the writings of past generations, women such as Jane Atwater received guidance for the present as she gained a sense of her religious heritage. Now in my book, I also argue that Methodist women's writings were not written nor appealed to under the same domestic conditions. And in the relatively early days of Methodism, they became a source of authority to which others turned to make sense of new and confusing spiritual experiences. Further, the life writings of Anglican women and their use of earlier writings took place within broader social and literary worlds and a religious world with less need to define itself according to the past or to delineate a new future. But in each case, women's life writings preserved by family, friends, and others embodied the past and were cherished as spiritual legacies. Thank you. Thank you so much, Cindy. That was absolutely fantastic. Very, very interesting indeed and illuminating. And I'm sure that everybody here this evening would, would like to show their appreciation for your fantastic talk this evening. Oh, thank you. Thank you so much. That was really interesting. Mm -hmm.